Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the 21st lecture of the course on sociological perspectives and modernity. Okay. Till now we have covered the modules on first thematic preliminaries, secondly sociological modernism through the works of Marx and Weber, thirdly structuralist interpretation through the works of Levi Strauss and Louis Althusser, fourthly we have covered the Western Marxist reflections on, on modernity, I mean uh, uh, society as a human creation through the works of Lukacs, Gramsci and Touré. Fifthly, we have discussed, I mean uh, thematic preliminaries I said, then sociological modernity, secondly, thirdly structuralist interpretation, fourthly Western Marxism, fifthly we have discussed the module on synthesizing modernity and social theory through the works of Wallerstein, Giddens and Habermas and, and now we will come to the, the sixth module on deconstruction of modernity okay. and in, in this module we are going to discuss the especially three important perspectives okay, which attempted to uh, which attempt to uh, deconstruct modernity okay. namely uh, feminism, secondly cultural studies and thirdly postmodern okay these three are very important so far as deconstructing modernities when i say deconstruction of modernity deconstruction is very integral to derrida's concept of difference okay we have already discussed this now under what circumstances under what limiting conditions okay we want to make sense of the feminist challenge to the linear view of modernity okay the the singular view of modernity namely european modernity and so on okay now let us see in this lecture and in the coming lecture in the in the next lecture what we are going to discuss we are going to discuss especially the feminist challenge to the discourse on european modernity okay and in another couple of lectures we will discuss cultural studies and then another couple of lectures will be devoted to postmodernist perspectives. Okay. Then we will try to forge a new totality okay. and so on. Now let us see how feminists, the scholars of the scholars drawn from feminist movements, feminist intellectual politics, they contributed to the domain of a critique to modernity or deconstruction of modernity. Okay. Feminism suggests that European modernity guided by the industrial revolution, enlightenment, critical thinking, uh, reasoning capacity and so on must be interrogated by different dimensions, by employing different parameters. And feminism poses key challenge to critical modernist paradigm in sociology. Those four central pillars of modernity namely holism or totality, reflexivity, rationality and social movements. Those four are the, the guiding principles of critical modernist paradigm in sociology and how feminists attempt to deconstruct those, those central themes of the critical uh, modernist paradigm in sociology. Okay? When I say feminism poses key challenge to critical modernist paradigm in sociology, in terms of what? In terms of intellectual politics. Okay. So, when I say, okay, if you look at this intellectual politics, okay, when I say whether, uh, I mean uh, it, it, it is related to a certain intellectual question which is historically conditioned, that that kind of intellectual politics when you look at, okay, when I say feminism poses key challenge to critical modernism in terms of intellectual politics, I mean the question is whether the two are compatible or opposed, whether 
feminism on the one hand and intellectual politics on the other, whether there is a compatibility or their dichotomy or they, they constitute dichotomy. I mean dichotomy, I mean they are opposed groups. Do we think that no intellectual politics okay, does not consider social movement as, as a part of critical modernist paradigm in sociology? If it does not include social movement as a, as a parameter of critical modernist paradigm in sociology, then feminism moves away from intellectual politics, Marxism also moves away from intellectual politics and so on. Now, if there is a compatibility with, with feminism and on the one hand and intellectual politics on the other, okay, precisely because both, both intellectual politics as well as feminism, they always try to include social movements okay, in today's world. For a long time, intellectual politics did not include social movement as a parameter of critical modernist paradigm in sociology. Okay. Whatever we discuss in, in academic setup need not have any bearing on social movement. Okay. Feminism posed that question, Marxism poses that. Okay. We will see what are the, the what, uh, what kind of analogy we can bring about so far as Marxism and feminism are concerned. Okay. That is why feminism on the one hand and, and intellectual politics on the other, is there a compatibility or are they opposed? Okay. And, and this points to earlier discussions on encounter between feminism on the one hand and postmodernism on the other. We will also discuss this okay, in these two lectures on, on feminist challenge to European majority. Okay. And, and when, we, when I say that there, there is an or there appears to be an encounter between feminism, postmodernism and critical modernist paradigm in sociology, okay, you may say one may say that no feminism and postmodernism okay, on the one hand they try to bring about a critique to critical modernism. It does not imply that feminism and postmodernism are same. No, they are different. There is also a close encounter between feminism on the one hand and postmodernism on the other. And, and in this lecture, what we are going to do, okay, this lecture, in fact, in these, these two lectures, these two lectures basically assume very basic knowledge about feminist ideas. Okay. Then, if I say that uh, feminism poses critical key challenge to critical modernism in terms of intellectual politics, Marxism also poses key challenge to critical modernist paradigm in sociology in terms of intellectual politics. Postmodernism also does. Scholars drawn from cultural studies also do the same. Then, that, then let us first discuss the analogy between feminism on the one hand and Marxism on the other. Okay. That in this sense, okay, now, we are going to discuss uh, the, those four parameters through which we try to, those through four lenses through which we try to examine a critical modernist paradigm in sociology. Let us start with social movements, because therein lies the significance of the analogy between Marxism and, and feminism. Okay. In terms of what they fall apart from intellectual politics. Okay. We will also discuss wh what are the, what are, uh, what the, we will also discuss the analogy between Marxism and postmodernism, feminism and postmodernism and so on. To start with, okay, we are trying to discuss the analogy between Marxism and feminism so far as social movement is, because social movements are very important components so far as critical modernist paradigm in sociology is concerned. Okay. It is very important. When I say there is an analogy between Marxism and feminism, okay, in terms of at least three parameters. One, the there must be an interaction between movement intellectuals and academic intellectuals. Okay. I mean the, the proponents of intellectual politics or the proponents of academic intellectual dominance. For a long time, even even to in 2017, uh, 2018, even today, we can say that uh, even in general, we do not tend to include social movements as a part of intellectual exchange of ideas. We always refer to the the the, um, uh, the freedom struggle that India had during the colonial period. We also refer back to. Uh, the October Revolution, Chinese Revolution, Industrial Revolution, French Revolution, and so on. Okay, but what we discuss does it have any bearing on the outside world today? 
that the, that that intellectual politics that no we will we'll just restrict our movement to only the, the these four walls okay we are not bothered whether because we are academic community we don't have any role to play so far as politics is concerned okay marxism feminism cultural studies postmodernism they all challenge this position this suggest okay both marxism i mean all marxism feminism cultural studies postmodernism they always suggest that there must be an interaction between academic intellectuals as well as movement intellectuals okay suppose if i have to give you a, uh, an example of some people who uh, who come under both who are considered both as movement intellectuals as well as academic intellectuals maybe anthony giddens immanuel wallerstein okay judith butler i mean they they are university professors michel foucault okay eric from theodor adorno uh, max horkheimer uh, and so on uh, okay even in india okay we find uh, many many people uh, at least at not many but at least a few people who come under uh, both who are considered both movement intellectuals as well as academic intellectuals okay they try to go beyond this this narrow distinction between movement intellectuals and academic intellectuals if there is no interaction between for for marxism for feminism if there is no interaction between movement intellectuals and academic intellectuals then then the, the this gap that is that will be created okay that will not be able to sustain our our desire for change okay that's why whatever we discuss here must have some kind of implications for our economic culture and polity okay there must be an interaction between movement intellectuals and academic intellectuals okay through what if if i say that there must be an interaction between movement intellectuals and academic intellectuals then there there is an urgent need of of recomposition within the academy this recomposition when i say there is an urgent need of recomposition within the academy okay i mean the academic intellectuals must try to learn from movement intellectuals i mean the practical experience the lived experience okay and then they must try to incorporate those things within the academic spaces okay that's why when we when we discuss certain things about suppose uh, patriarchy suppose we discuss something about inequality that is there as i mean the, the way we encounter these things the way we confront with these things in in a, in the larger social societal setup they must be included in the academic spaces okay not simply for discussion but to but to ensure social change economic change political change cultural change okay ideological change okay and feminism as well as marxism they emphasize on the fact that that there is there is an urgent need of recomposition within the academy okay and the third analogy between marxism and feminism suggests that i mean there are certain characteristics from social movements what are those characteristics i mean there must be a concern for agency human action not simply human action but purposive human action intentional human action okay that agency may be guided by certain ideology okay that that human agency must be guided through certain experience lived experience reflexive positions that human agency is going to undertake okay this is very important okay then we have we have discussed three parameters through which we can bring about um, an analogy between marxism and feminism one the interaction between there must be an interaction between movement intellectuals and uh, academic intellectuals secondly there is an urgent need of recomposition within the academy and thirdly we must understand certain characteristics from social movements i mean concern for agency ideology experience lived experience reflexivity and so on okay these, these are basic uh, uh, ideas i mean about about marxism and feminism okay. the the historical movement of the emergence of second wave feminism and the interaction with with the 1968 great revolution in france okay led by students we have already discussed this okay 
and also early 1970s had left important for understanding development modernity and so on when i say second wave feminism there is a there is a difference between first wave feminism and second wave feminism please remember one thing there is a vast 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 literature on first wave feminism second wave feminism and so on but there is a basic difference there is a basic difference between first wave feminism and second wave feminism okay please remember this that uh, what is prime fsc what is first wave feminism in the uh, in the first couple of decades of the 20th century okay i mean women fought for suffrage i mean franchise power to vote okay equal wage working hours in terms of uh, working hours and so on okay i mean if i have to go back to the first decade of the 20th century 1908 99 and so on okay left wing democratic women they first started that no we want equal wage just like men there was absolute inequality okay even today there is inequality so far as uh, wage is concerned even in india okay so far as uh, male and female or men and women are concerned okay you can you can just look at uh, how much the captain of indian male cricket team receives what is his salary and what is the salary of the captain of indian women's cricket team i mean huge difference even by the bcci and so on and government also has ig- has been ignoring these aspects then when left wing democratic women they made an attempt for such equal wage patterns equal i mean uh, equal suffrage patterns equal franchise i mean power to vote okay. they just kept it as de facto rights of women it was not it it did not come under the legal framework in the second wave feminism those de facto rights became de jure rights if i have to say that uh, what do you mean by the transition from first wave feminism to second wave feminism now the transition from first wave feminism to second wave feminism implies that there is a transition from de facto rights to de jure rights my my power to vote my power to um, uh, exercise my franchise i mean universal adult franchise uh, universal adult suffrage okay equal wage and so on they came under legal scanner legal purview in the second wave feminism which was not there in uh, in the first wave okay and and feminist writers okay devote little time to the movement as such and the feminist theory of social movements therefore is limited okay the way you will find um, theories on race class okay perhaps theories have uh, i'm i'm sh- i'm sure uh, people have been working on these issues but but um, uh, and and it it's vast literature is available okay and 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 the way scholars of uh, uh, scholars drawn from uh, feminist perspective devote little time to the movement as such and the feminist theory of social movements is limited most interest actually is on recovering history of first wave feminism rather than understanding the contemporary women's movement in sociological terms okay and such dissociation from contemporary women's movements in sociological terms has negatively affected women's movements not simply in india but across the continents in the world okay that's why i said uh, historical movement of the emergence of second wave feminism and interaction with uh, uh, 1968 great revolution in france led by students okay had left important uh, have have significant Im- implications for our understanding of development and modernity okay and mostly feminist scholars okay Uh, they are engaged in recovering the history of first wave feminism rather than understanding the contemporary women's movements in sociological terms and such dissociation such disinterest okay is said with other identity politics movements and contrasts with marxist emphasis on on analysis of present movement now it it deviates from marxism okay this such dissociation from contemporary women's movements in sociological terms 
is shared with other identity politics movement, may be caste, may be race, may be ethnicity and so on, nationality and so on, regionality and so on, religion, okay. they are all identity based politics, but that and hence they contrast with Marx, Marx's emphasis on the analysis of present movements. Okay. And that is a, the, in, in feminism, you will find there is a stronger focus on enemy agency. These are backlash effects in terms of ideology, in terms of patriarchy and so on. Okay. It is also related, I mean feminist writers, they also dwell upon their uh, certain engagement related to political and at times rhetorical strategy of arguing for necessary links between structure and between structure, demands, action and, and reluctance to examine conditions. When, when feminists try to look at modernity as, as, uh, as forging a political strategy of arguing for necessary links between structure and agency, structure and action, okay, okay. The structure may be captured by patriarchy. Patriarchy is also, a, I mean, patriarchy itself is a structure. Okay. Then women's interests, I mean, they they are a part of agency. Women's interests also can become a structure. Okay, uh, at times, and the demands, the concerns that patriarchy in fact has sabotaged our economic, culture, and polity, and their relationship with what kind of movement that we are going to forge against patriarchal social order. And it is also related to certain level of reluctance to examine the conditions for this. It is also related to related not to provide any, any explanation. It is also related to uh, the interests of 1970s Marxism in ideology um, and structure but not agency. I mean, in the works of structuralists, uh, we have seen, uh, I mean, uh, Althusser himself uh, was a neo Marxist, and we have examined Althusser under the rubric of structuralist interpretation of modernity precisely because he is, he is not only a neo Marxist but also a structural Marxist. Okay. And, and, and the way feminists try to dwell upon these, okay. That, that structure becomes more important okay, than, than human agency. Okay. Now, for Marx, yes, structure is important, no doubt about it, but it is the human agency which is going to ensure social change, to make change possible. For feminists, perhaps, perhaps femini, uh, for uh, most of the feminist scholars, okay, not all, okay, most of the feminist scholars they have been trying to dwell upon the structure more in contradistinction with what kind of concerted organized political action is required to, to alter such social order, to alter such political order, to alter such patriarchal social order and so on. Okay. This is very important. Okay. Now, now when, I, when we have to go beyond certain things, that that uh, empirical uh, empirically when we look at this okay before before getting into empirical uh, uh, discussion okay i mean then what we have discussed till now we have discussed an analogy between marxism and feminism okay and then we have discussed um, the distinction between first wave feminism and second wave feminism okay and the disinterest uh, or the dissociation from contemporary women's movements in sociological terms by, by uh, to a large extent by, uh, by feminist writers is shared with other identity politics movements. I mean these feminist movements, they have, they have become a part of identity politics movements just like caste, race mm, uh, or that is why whenever, whenever we look at identity politics movements, we look at uh, caste, race, gender, uh, ethnicity, nationality and so on. Okay. In contradistinction with Marx's reflections on the analysis of present movements in terms of class. You see, class is not an identity politics movement. The, the, uh, it is uh, class becomes, uh, class is different I mean uh, in this sense. Feminists 
tend to uh, focus more on enemy agency okay, in terms of backlash effects, ideology, patriarchy uh, and so on. That is why they, they put so much importance on, on structure, okay, ideology and so on, but not agency. Okay. That is why there is an again here you will find there is an analogy between uh, feminism on the one hand and Althusser on the other, other. Even within structural Marxism, Marxist trade, structural Marxist trend, okay, Althusser was thinking of not the actual mode of production, but the idea of mode of production. If you can slightly recall in structuralist interpretation of modernity, we have discussed. Okay. That is why it is also uh, feminists also are more interested in the 1970s Marxism in terms of ideology and structure in, in Althusserian sense, but not agency. Okay. The, 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 the empirical questions of compatibility uh, identity movements okay, are raised okay, as is the question of the nature of women's or men's identity and so on. It is very important to understand these things that, that uh, these, these empirical questions. Okay. So, far as social movements are concerned. Now, when we look at reflexivity and rationality, okay, we will we'll discuss holism in, in the next lecture, okay. but in, in this lecture we, we will discuss um, um, reflexivity and rationality. Uh, so, far as the feminist challenge to critical modernist paradigm in sociology is concerned. Okay. One is they emphasize more on lived experience. Uh, okay. We are going to discuss E. P. Thompson and uh, Raymond Williams later on when we will discuss uh, uh, cultural studies and so on. Lived experience, I mean what I experience as a human agency. My experience may be different from that of yours, it does not imply that or my experience may, may be different from the general societal experience, it does not imply that my experience will be less significant than the social experience societal experience. My experience is unique to my own case. Okay. Feminists, they always try to look at these aspects that not all women have the same experience, that those lived experiences must be foregrounded properly. Okay. Secondly, there is a concern to take women's knowledge seriously. Okay. For a long time, even, even in today's world, there is a, there is a general perception not to take women's knowledge uh, uh, seriously. They always get uh, a second hand trade, I mean, uh, I mean stepmotherly treatment. It is very important to understand this that when we look at equality between men and women, we must create a society, create a space where the, the, the relationship between women and men will not be located or situated uh, or forged on unequal terms. And this is also a part of my lived experience that if women's knowledge on, on certain things on, on, on everything, I mean everything will not be taken seriously, then, then the world will not be a livable place as we have been observing. Okay? The world will be a livable place only when both women and men participate uh, in the decision making process. This is very important. The when we look at reflexivity particularly, there is a relationship, uh, I mean it must be related to theoretical and organizational skills developed within women's mind. Those lived experiences, they also create a space for theories, they also create a space for the emergence of theory, they also create a space for organizational skills developed within women's movements. Okay. The kind of organizational skills which are uh, the which is required in peasant movement, in in manufacturing sector uh, workers movements or banking sector, insurance sector uh, workers movements, that, that the same organizational skills cannot be copied in the context of uh, women's movements. You see, organizational skills must be very creative. Okay, that's why feminists they developed a critique to. Leninist model of deduced and imposed knowledge. Okay. There, there, there you will find that uh, there is a problem here. Okay. I mean problem in the sense what Lenin did uh, in the Soviet Union that he tried to 
specify certain classes who can bring about a social and political revolution in, in Russia. He looked at industrial workers, he looked at peasantry and so on, who will bring about that revolution. Then for a long time, it became a Leninist model that yes, we can, we can go ahead with, with uh, social and political revolution only through industrial workers. Even peasantry was reduced, I mean peasantry was removed from that, that scenario. It was only when Mao Zedong in, in China, he carried out a revolution through peasantry called cultural revolution. Only then peasantry was also considered of having the power to make social change possible. Okay? And on, in this case, okay, feminists bring about a critique to such, such, such model of deduced and imposed knowledge. Then especially critique of speaking for women. We do not want to speak for or against, what we are trying to speak against patriarchy, against violence, against domestic violence, against violence at the workplace, against sexual assault and such things are very important. I mean such lived experiences are very important and the, the methodology that uh, we can bank on may be, may be drawn from oral history. Life, hist life story, biographical methodology and so on and, and there must be a here a reflexivity and rationality I am going to discuss at a time, I mean in this section that there must be a concern to broaden the area of relevant knowledge. What is relevant knowledge? What is science? What is relevant science? There is always uh, as Weber said, no emotive social action, affective social action, they are meaningless, I mean it is uh, meaningless, it is unreflective in nature and so on. For him it was only instrumental rationality which assumes greater significance. For feminists, no, let us not have such kind of splits. Emotion also produces knowledge because emotion is also based on my lived experience. Okay? That they refuse to get into such uh, cognitive splits between uh, what is uh, analytic on the one hand and normative on the other, okay? rational and emotional um, and so on objective and subjective and so on. Okay. This is very important. What is relevant knowledge okay, is also a serious question that is why feminists try to overcome or feminists refuse or feminists refuse to accept such uh, cognitive splits between analytic and normative, rational and emotional and so on. Okay. And then of course, what kind of reflexivity and rationality that we talk about that legitimation of for example, sexuality, housework as serious subject. People very often say that okay, I mean uh, women will be engaged in cooking and men will do the outdoor work. Okay. Such division of labor is very dangerous for, for any society. Okay. Such thinking is lethal for any society. When I say cognitive splits between analytic and normative, rational and emotional and so on, cognitive splits are seen as legitimizing uh, or legitimating exclusion of women's experience and concerns. These, these cognitive splits have been created just to legitimize the way women's experiences, lived experiences, concerns, issues can be excluded. Okay? And hence, critical modern modernism is seen as colluding in this domination by political economy and uh, instrumental rationality. And feminists here, they try to give a, uh, they try to provide a critique to Marx as well as Weber. Okay? I mean, when I say political economy in terms of Marx and an instrumental rationality, I mean Weber. Okay? Then there is a political shift from, from instrumentally rational hierarchical logics to organization as an aim in itself, issue of organization of academic mode of production. Okay. It is very important to understand this. Okay. When there is a political shift from instrumentally rational hierarchical logics to organization as, a, as aim in itself, okay, therein lies the significance of the issues of organization of academic mode of production. I am just using this term because uh, uh, Marx always used the term mode of production. Okay. 
uh, but academic mode of production in fact Stan, uh, uh, Stanley used it for the first time okay. that there is a hierarchy even within academy okay. there is also power structure even within academy okay. and so on okay. because the kind of knowledge that we produce the kind of knowledge that we generate okay, is also not universal okay. we must doubt what kind of knowledge we have produced or what kind of relevant knowledge that we have certified we must interrogate that we must question that okay if if knowledge was universal could be articulated or and could be reduced uh, or deduced from uh, general principles anyone could speak for anyone else but it doesn't work in practice that's why knowledge is relative knowledge is uh, not universal our rationality also is relative it is not universal our reflexivity also is not uh, absolute it is also relative uh, it is also partial that is why what I experience may differ from your experience and your experience may differ from her experience, her experience may differ from his experience, his experience may differ from the entire societal experience. Our experiences are pretty unique to our own existence, our own uh, practices, our own uh, structures and our the way we try to cope with certain situations. Okay. What then we have discussed in this lecture? We have discussed the feminist challenge to critical modernist paradigm in sociology in terms of social movements, reflexivity and rationality. In the next lecture, we are going to discuss the feminist challenge to critical modernist paradigm in sociology in terms of holism or totality. Thank you.